yeah, these are, they're real barriers and they're psychological barriers as much as anything else, because, you know, we know that you can gain literacy and numeracy skills from doing this work. Um, it requires perhaps a little more creativity from the teacher's perspective, particularly if they've never been trained to think this way at all. And teachers are under the gun. I mean, there's so much on your laps. I mean, I, I think of teachers as the real heroes of, of our world. And, you know, I sometimes can get teary just talking about it. Um, it's a little story, but um, when I was in, um, in college, I was dating a medical student and I'd gone to college pre-med and then sort of dropped that path. And one day he said to me that he thought that being a physician was the most noble profession. And I remember getting really irritated by the comment. I mean, first of all, it seems sort of silly to rate professions based on their nobility and who does that. Um, but then I also felt a little defensive probably because I'd gone to college pre-med and now I wasn't gonna do that. I didn't know what I was gonna do with my life. Um, and, and it stuck with me all these years. And I found myself you know, about 15 years ago remembering this comment and reflecting upon it and thinking, you know, I still think it's silly to rate professions based on their nobility, but if pressed, I would say that teaching is the most noble profession because there is no other profession that holds the future in its hands. I mean, are we going to solve the crises that we face globally or, or not? The answer to that question lies more with teachers than anybody else. So, one of the things that's so sad to me is that the profession and and the way that the sort of monolith of teaching has gone down in the last 10 or 15 years has so crushed the spirit of so many teachers that the that's why I say it's a big psychological barrier. Because I think that, you know, when you feel just so oppressed by the system, um, it can be hard to maintain that that energy and creativity. So I'll, I'll tell you one example of what we're hoping to do to help teachers in this way. So I just applied for a grant um, last month. And so fingers crossed we'll get it. And um, it's with it will be a partnership with Maine ASCD and the Maine Curriculum Leaders Association to create a micro-credentialing path using the solutionary guidebook so that teachers could get micro-credentialed um, and really understand this process. And we would have uh, teachers become coaches to other teachers. So um, teachers can do this micro-credentialing, coaches can do it, and then those coaches are then paired with other teachers to really help this process. So for teachers who feel like it's just too overwhelming, where do I start? They will have a process. So hopefully we'll get that grant and we'll produce that. And then that will be something that can be replicated in other states. This is to do this in Maine uh, first, but you know, there's no reason somebody couldn't do a micro-credential from Maine ASCD. And, um, and hopefully that'll happen and, and that will remove one of those barriers. Yeah, that, that'd be fantastic. And I, and I, I think your comment is spot on. We, we lose sight of the bigger picture so often because we just become focused on, you know, raising a test score or um, moving some kind of standard rubric or like, like the, the, the tools of teaching have somehow displaced the overall purpose, right? Which is exactly what you said. Um, and it's, it's so, it's so disheartening sometimes to think that we have to, if we're gonna, if we're gonna get kids to make that change, then we have to get into those curriculum conversations where all those things get started, um, and it really change things from the ground up. Yes, and you know, <laughs> having just um, zoomed into um, Julia and Donna's classes last week, you know, these kids, uh, when they are enlivened by education like this they're, it's almost like they're a different species. You know, uh, it, it was so exciting and energizing to see those children so enthused, so, so dedicated to being solutionaries themselves. Um, 
about five years ago, I was invited to speak in a school, a middle school, and I asked the fifth and sixth graders to raise their hand. Well, first to tell me what they thought were the biggest problems in the world. And we filled up a whiteboard. One, you know, 10 year old boy said sex trafficking. You know, they're not learning this in school. This is what these children know. I mean, what you were just talking about, you know, these kids know so much. And when I asked them to raise their hands, if they thought we could solve these problems, only five out of 45 kids raised their hands. They just didn't believe that they could solve them. So the next year I was speaking in to a group of fifth graders in um, Guadalajara, Mexico, in an international school. And when I got there, I didn't know I was going to be speaking to the fifth graders. So they invited me and I thought, oh, I'm just going to ask them, you know, to raise their hands if they thought we could solve the problems in the world. And every hand flew up. And what was different was that they were being taught in age appropriate ways about problems in the world and they were solving them. So they already had solar panels on their school. They had built a compost system. They were making all these changes. They knew problems could be solved because they were solving them. So, you know, if we are not giving young people the opportunity to make a difference and they are exposed day after day to terrible news in the world, there's no, it's no wonder they feel so despairing. And the reality is things in the world, with the exception of climate change, things in the world have gotten so much better. You know, I'm 58 years old. When I was born, segregation was legal. The Civil Rights Act was passed when I was three years old. You know, when I was born, um, more than half of the people in the world lived in extreme poverty. And that number is now around 11%. So still too high, but that's a huge change. You know, when I was born, the very thought that gays and lesbians could get married was, it, it wasn't even something you would ever think was possible. And it happened, you know, almost in the blink of an eye. When you think about that change from when it was introduced as a concept to when it passed and was upheld by the Supreme Court, that was a blink of the eye. So I think it's really important that young people understand that things have gotten so much better, again, with the exception of climate change, and there is no reason that they can't continue to get better but you won't know that if you're just going to be exposed to the media because you know the media is not going to tell us about the good things that have happened and it and we have more and more exposure to the really terrifying things that are happening and we just have to let young people be part of the solution or they will feel hopeless